Hello and welcome to another Rahalas Dapad, this time with the amazing Professor Alice Roberts. It's a very brainy one, you're going to love it. Um, look, we're on tour constantly with Rahalas Dapad uh, in Canterbury on the 17th of July, if you're watching this on the day it goes out, with Vic Reeves and Barry from EastEnders. Come on, there are still tickets, you've got to come. And um, then on in York on the 26th of July, I want to say, with uh, the fantastic Rebecca Callard. Then I'm at the Edinburgh Fringe from the 2nd to 25th of uh, August, not Mondays, at the Newtown Theatre at 1.30pm. It's a great big theatre, there's lots of seats left, believe me. We've got some terrific acts uh, booked in already, including Jen Brister, Tony Slattery, Lucy Beaumont, Phil Wang, Vicky Stone, Jeff Norcott, Richard Osman, Tommy Tiernan wants to do it, Basil Brush wants to do it. Uh, I think we can't get Eddie, Eddie as well because he's done at the same time, sadly, but we'll see if we can sort something out along those lines. And uh, loads more to come, so go to richtang.com slash rahalastapata slash tour. And you can see all the links and all the guests as they get confirmed. RichTang.com slash gigs, if you can't remember that. Uh, do go to rahalaspa.co.uk. Uh, become a member if you want, and you can get all sorts of extras uh, that and help pay for the podcast by becoming a monthly badger. But uh, you can just check out the podcasts uh, for free, and there's lots of stuff on that on that website as well anyway come on enough of this gabbing let's get on with the old podcast the chatting asking people if they've ever tried to suck their own cock and so on that's mainly what happens in this one so i hope you're going to enjoy that all right see you later bye Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Leicester Square Theatre. Please welcome a man who's just been home and met the girl he fancied when he was 10 years old. It's Richard Herring. <laughs> Yay! Hello! Welcome. Welcome, my friends, to this podcast. Uh, this is Richard Herring's Loganbury Strawberry and Thimbleberry podcast. Um... It's all about those specific three berries. The thimbleberry, you may not be familiar with. It's like a wild raspberry. It's a bit soft, it doesn't preserve well as a raspberry. You can still make jam out of it. Um, just those three. People say Loganberry, which isn't that a mix between a raspberry and a blackberry. It's very raspberry heavy, this new podcast idea of yours. And they're not, it's different. It's a very, there's no raspberries in it at all, only those three. Strawberry is not an official berry. <laughs> But I was, I was drinking absinthe with Guy de Maupassant and Ernest Hemingway the other day. Not when I started drinking the absinthe, but when I, once I started, they just appeared. Started drinking with me, and they both call it Rahalastaba, so I don't know if that's going to catch on. So, yeah, I've been, I, I, I returned uh, like, uh, to my own hometown, like a sort of Jesus, uh, this weekend, and did a gig for the Cheddar Youth Trust. I'm sure you all follow that charity. Uh, it's been over 20 years, this charity. And my dad, right at the beginning, said, just put 20 quid a month uh, standing order on your bank account going into the charity. I said, yeah, I'll do that. It's a nice thing to do. I've forgotten to take it off. I've been paying 20 quid a month. For, that's about £7,000 I've paid those cheddar, you fuckers. <laughs> and then they come and get me out to do a free gig in cheddar when I was ill. Uh, so, but I, I just, before I did this gig, this woman came up to me and said, long time no see. And uh, I kind of looked, it's cruel to do this right, because I had literally hadn't seen this woman for 35 years. I was looking at her going, ah, oh, yeah, yeah. And then I looked at her for about 10 seconds, and I realised it was Bridget, who, uh, when, I was at, when I went on a school trip when I was about 11, 12 years old to France, I was completely in love with her. She was a very tall, willowy beauty. Uh, I was a short, fat, little virginal schoolboy. I mean, I was 12, that's fair enough, but I was... <laughs> I was going to be a virgin for another seven years after that as well, which is not so exciting. <laughs> and uh, I, I, try, I, made, I wrote funny poems for her, uh, and every time she was around, I, would, with, I was singing, Like a Bridget over troubled waters. 
that did, that's not a good way to seduce people called Bridget. That's just a little bit of... It didn't, it didn't work, but she was... It was nice. She, later on, I thought, well, maybe beforehand, uh, you know, remember the Bross twins went to my school as well. She got off with both of the Bross twins, separately, I believe. Even the Skellington face one. <laughs> so it's lovely to see her again, but it did take me that moment to realise. Uh, it's, sort of, it's sort of weird going back to your hometown. Uh, when I arrived, there were, t- were two, like... Uh, probably 10 year old girls walking past my mum and dad's house in Fairland school uniform and I, I was turning in and went yo yo Fairland and like that and my wife said that's probably scared those girls they probably don't know what's <laughs> they recognised me as one of them they didn't realise that everything's changed in Cheddar every single it used to be all fields when I was a kid and now it's they've built on everywhere and I went down the wreck which is the one bit of the field left and there were some kids there sitting on the wreck drinking cider like I used to when I was 13 and um, I, my dog ran over to them and I was thinking everything's so different here you know, I'm, why can't I hang out on the wreck and drink with teenagers anymore like and the dog ran over and then they ran away and one of the girls said that dog is lush uh, and I thought yeah something's haven't changed that's amazing that's what we, exactly what we used to say that dog's lush it's a very cheddar thing so that was nice oh, happy days <laughs> Anyway, I'm going to crack on uh, with, uh, with the show. Um, my guest this week is probably best known for her thesis on rotator cuff disease in humans and apes, her paleopathological and evolution perspective on shoulder pathology. That's why we're... <laughs> that's why we've all come tonight to find out a bit more about that. Will you please welcome the amazing Professor Alice Roberts, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Come in, sit down. Hey, make yourself at home. A fellow, do they say, do they say lush in, in your part of Somerset? Gert Lush? Yeah, Gert Lush. Gert yeah, Lush not is just a bit lush, more Bristol. But Gert lush. Yeah, that's a bit more Bristol. We just that went for lush. Bristol. Lush. We didn't, yeah. we didn't show off about our lushness. <laughs> it was regular. So should we talk about the uh, pathology of uh, shoulder? I've got a bad shoulder at the moment, so I thought that's partly why I brought this up. So I wonder if you could help me out with... It. This is the thing, everyone's got bad shoulders. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's one of the most common, common pathologies <laughs> as you get older. You can write a thesis about and it. I, yeah, and I've written my... I, done, I did my PhD quite late because I did it um, when I'd already qualified as a doctor and I was already lecturing and anatomy and I did it really slowly over seven years. And as I did my PhD, I developed rotator cuff disease. <laughs> and so I was looking at ancient skeletons that had these things that I could kind of feel in my own, own shoulders. And I've yeah. definitely got osteoarthritis around my clavicles, but everyone's got that. Yeah. But yeah, it was fascinating. Because what well, I've got, yeah. I, just, I just got you on to try and diagnose this. I went to my doctor and he just said, take, take uh, ibuprofen. Pretty much. He said, have you been doing that? Yeah. And I said, no. He said, well, do that. It annoys me when people come around and they haven't even done that. I said, I've never hurt my arm before. <laughs> so it's down, it hurts like there, and it hurts if I go like that. Yeah. And it used to hurt when I did that, but it's not so bad now. It's when I re... Is, yeah. that, is that it? A bit, what bit do I... of subacromial impingement there, it's I just, think. It's just yeah. down there. There's too I, many things. I There's sleep this bit on of bone. it. There's this bit of bone that sticks out here called the acromion, yeah. which is badly named because it means the top of the shoulder, but it's not actually the top of the shoulder because no. the lateral clavicle is higher than the acromion. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Um, I knew these guys would love that stuff. <laughs> I think you've found your crowd. Yeah. Try that at the comedy store later on a Saturday. You're getting nothing but here. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all these things underneath. There's like the bit of biceps goes up, the long head of biceps, and then supraspinatus tendon. There's a subacromial burst. So there's just too many things in one What do space. I do to make my arm better is why that's the only reason you had. Uh, rest it a bit and take some ibuprofen. <laughs> Ages. I've had it for two series of Brahellas, but that's how... Well done. Congratulations. Uh, the other thing I was going to say is your best-known thing, which I think is very, too impressive to be your best-known thing, is that you won the Blue Peter Young Artist of the Year in 1988 and were on the cover of the Radio Times with, some, with Mark Curry, was he one of them? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and Yvette Fielding. Yeah, Yvette yeah. Fielding, two of the, you know, the, they're the sort of Sylvester McCoys of the Blue Peter world. <laughs> But I was annoyed, though, about that. Why? The whole thing was, like, faintly annoying. Uh, because the competition was to design the cover of the Radio Times. So I did a really nice picture that was the cover of the Radio Times. It even had a gap at the top where you could write Radio Times. And then they obviously decided that actually what they wanted to do was have the presenters on the cover. So they weren't going to have the picture. 
And then they, as a kind of sop to me, they said, well, we'll have your picture as though it's in an art gallery and you can be in it too. And I was like, I don't really want to be in it. I just want my picture to be on the front of the Reese <laughs> Times. Lies. Wow. Is the BBC lying again? Well, Blue Peter's got a, got a history of it, of course, hasn't it, has, it? With the yeah. cats as well, the cat and, names. Yeah, yeah, taking coke all the time as well, they do. Oh, yeah, that too. <laughs> That's why they don't care. Then. Do we even do? I don't remember doing a competition. Fuck, we're gonna have to. <laughs> off my fucking tits that day. <laughs> they can't, can't. There's no way we get a kid to design the cover of the Radio <laughs> Times. Who's like, who said that was gonna happen? <laughs> <laughs> Must be very happy. To be, did you get invited to the end of your Radio Times party where all the cover stars get to? Yeah. Go to? Did you? Yeah. I did. did you go? Yeah. Wow. I didn't know who anyone was. You must have but they had good nibbles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good nibbles. Yeah. yeah, good nibbles. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Those topless no. end of year radio times parties are notorious. So you were very talented even from a very young age. So you were 14 or 15 back then. Yeah, I was 14 when I did the picture. It's incredible. Yeah. And that's not, you've not even gone on to be an artist. You've gone on to be all these other things you are author, TV presenter. I kind of struggled with it though, because I wanted to do art. I really wanted to do art. And I did, um, and I kind of dabbled with it a bit. So. Um, I did have once a best-selling range of dinosaur cards in WH Smith. Did you? That's how I funded my anatomy degree. Um, I mean, they were awful. I'm kind of really embarrassed with them now. They're kind of like little pink stegosauruses and purple iguanodons. That is probably not accurate. Yeah, but nobody knows. We do don't they? know, do we? So, don't know no, what exactly. colour they were. They weren't feathery, though. They should have no. been feathery, shouldn't they? They should yeah. have been, really. Yeah. Uh, if anyone wants a refund on those <laughs> dinosaur postcards. <laughs> Do get in touch. I, the one of the well, you, the, the one of the first times I became uh, more aware of you because you've been going since you, did, you were on Time Team, weren't you? Early on, so I must have seen you on that because I love Time Team. Um, and uh, but the incredible Human Journey, which is a series you did, and there was a book accompanying that, which came out at the same time as I was uh, doing a show called Hitler Mustache, in where I, which I grew a Hitler mustache for some reason. <laughs> Can't I think to be offensive to people? <laughs> Uh, in order to, to, to look at our attitudes towards uh, people with Hitler moustache, <laughs> it turns out not good. <laughs> people are still quite anti Hitler. Um, but the show was sort of about uh, race and, uh, and, the, and the way the well, well, that idea that uh, the British National Party claiming, you know, we're British, we're from Britain, we're <laughs> the only people from Britain are allowed to be in Britain. Uh, and that book was about the idea that um, we've, come, we've all come from... Well, at that point, things have changed in the last nine or ten years, but we've all come Science from... does that. A little, annoying. For, yeah. for we've all come from West Africa, and uh, every human being who isn't African is related to this basically one tribe who yeah, left yeah. Africa about 70,000 years ago. So it was a, that was my first big landmark series on the BBC. So we went off filming that in 2008 and just went everywhere. And it was an extraordinary experience and, you know, met some interesting people, get filmed with Bushmen in Namibia and ranger herders in, in Siberia. But when you're actually out doing that kind of filming, mostly what you feel like you're doing is moving 36 really large pieces of luggage around the world <laughs> and then occasionally fitting in a bit of filming in the gaps. Yeah. But yeah, it was, a, it was I, I loved it. And I think that there's that really positive side of science that I've always been interested in conveying and that it's, it's humanitarian and humane and it's about empathising with everybody because everybody's a cousin. Yes. Well, it's sort of in, it's crazy, that idea, anyway, of anyone being... As, as all these now, these DNA, te DNA tests people can do, which you've done one, you're 2.9% Neanderthal. 2.7%. Two, oh, sorry. But still more than Bill Bailey. Yeah. Which is... I'm really surprising. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> I mean, 2.7 is a lot, though. That's like a foot, isn't it? It's, it's, that's... <laughs> And we can see your feet, so it must be something, maybe yeah. a shin. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I, um, I got interviewed for the um, Natural History Museum Human Evolution Gallery about that. In fact, I think they arranged the test. And um, they said, oh, you know, it's a bit of fun, really, because you, obviously you can't trace your family history back as far as when your great, 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 great grandma or granddad was a Neanderthal. But um, have, a chat to your, have a chat to your parents about your more recent family tree. So I did. Um, and then in the context, so I'd spoken to them both separately, and, um, uh, and my dad said, um, oh, yeah, so uh, you're 2.7% Neanderthal. That'll be a mum's side, because she's the short and stocky one. <laughs> and, um, and so I said this, 
when I was interviewed by Chris Stringer at the Natural History Museum, and it's still in the video. And <laughs> this was meant to be like a temporary exhibition, but now it's turned into a permanent <laughs> exhibition. Right. I thought I was completely safe, because my mum comes up to London, she never goes to the Natural <laughs> History Museum, she goes to the V&A. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, sort of about a year later, she said, one of my friends has been to London, Alex, I've got a bone to pick with you. <laughs> Well, really with your dad, to be fair, it's he who said it. <laughs> yeah, exactly, blame yeah. him, yeah. They were, a bit, were they a bit bigger than us Neanderthals anyway? Kind of, well, a bit, yeah, yeah, they were slightly more muscly. Yeah. Um, they had bigger brains than us on average as well, yeah. it's interesting. So there was a lot of, I mean, they didn't used to think this was the case, but there was a lot of interspecial having a, a little crack in going on, especially yeah. in your family, but 2.9%, 2.7%. I know. That's a lot of shagging Neanderthals. Uh, it's just, we, yeah, see, so when I made that Human Journey series, they got out some mitochondrial DNA, which is just a little tiny bit, um, but quite good for tracing family histories back. And there wasn't any suggestion that there'd been any interchange of genes with, yeah. between modern humans and Neanderthals. Then they did the genome. They managed to get a whole genome sequenced uh, and went, oh, no, no, it turns out, it turns <laughs> out we did. And then it's not just, the, the revelations have just come thick and fast since then. So that pa the paper that dropped that, Bombshell was 2010, I think. Right. The year after my program, my series went back. <laughs> Wait, course. Said, we definitely, yeah, we didn't, definitely didn't interview the Neanderthals. And then, of course, the BBC repeat everything. Yeah. So that, I mean, that series has just been on again with people going, hang on, hang on a minute. <laughs> I thought, anyway, so, yeah, so, I mean, since 2010, we've then had all these other revelations of interbreeding with uh, basically any other human species we find and we can get the DNA out of, we've interbred with them. Yeah. I mean, you would, so, though, wouldn't you? There's not much, especially in the olden days, there wasn't yeah. much... I'd have shagged a couple of monkeys if I'd been. I'd I would definitely have, you know, just to see what, what came out. Especially in those early days when evolution was really happening, right? <laughs> <laughs> Never know what's going to come up, but definitely if a Neanderthal came in here now, I'd ring my wife and say, there's a Neanderthal, quite attractive I'm Neanderthal, have to try male, I don't care, male or female. <laughs> out of scientific curiosity, surely you must be the same. Um, so I've got to have to shag it, but I still love you, and, it's, uh, and I didn't promise not to shag a Neanderthal if you remember back to the battle. Um, you would, though, wouldn't you? You'd have just be interested to no, see. I you would no, just I to see what it's like. Uh, and there's, but there's another whole species of the which I the de, de, Denisonvia. Oh, de, de, what how did you say it? Uh, the you can say it anywhere one. you want, really, but yeah, Denisovans, and yeah. they're from this cave called Denisova, which I think just means Dennis's cave right. in uh, <laughs> Siberia. So it was just one bloke called Dennis who <laughs> was this species. <laughs> and um, yeah, so they had two two teeth uh, and a finger bone, yeah. and nobody knew what it was from. And then they got DNA out of it, and it was different from us, and it was different from Neanderthals. And so they've called it Denisovans. They can't give it a species name because you can't give a species name just on the basis of DNA. Uh, but we don't know what it looks like. It's very frustrating for me. I mean, I'm a bone specialist. I want to actually look at some bones, and it's not really much. Oh, they found a bit of skull recently. Right. I got excited about that, and they were like, oh, I found a bit of skull that belongs to the Denisovans as well. And I was like, oh, good. I hope it's an exciting bone, like the sphenoid bone or the temporal bone, and it was the parietal. I mean, who wants oh, a bit of parietal? It's always, isn't it? It's always oh. this. <laughs> Ru rubbish. <laughs> but we're related to there's some of them in us as well is that right yeah yeah, yeah. especially um you can just get that from a finger that's amazing that. i know yeah we've got there's a lot of dna in all of you yeah there is it's <laughs> clever isn't it <laughs> just need a little bit i've seen jurassic park i know how it works <laughs> uh so i watched it with my kids yesterday <laughs> yeah. i said um, i've got a five-year-old it's probably you know possibly not a good idea to watch jurassic park with a five because it's quite scary um, and I said, look, there's scary bits in this, and just, if you want it to stop, just say, um, and you can come and sit next to me. And, and we stopped it before the scene with the velociraptors in the, um, in the kitchen. And then we said, now, this is a scary bit. So do you want to stop it? And they were like, no, it's just getting good. Um, but there was one bit that my, my little boy kind of came cuddling up to me, and I thought he was scared of something. And he said, um, uh, mummy, and Sam and Neil had just been having this conversation about not wanting children because they're too expensive. And um, he kind of cuddled up to me and went, Mummy, uh, he said children were expensive. And I said, yeah, you are. And he said, but you, d you didn't buy me. <laughs> it's good. So it's very educational. It's a very educational film. <laughs> Um, so, so what's the truth? What, what is the truth of humanity? Where did we come from? There's been lots of 
people coming out of Africa at different times, obviously. Yeah. So there was, there was the Neanderthals and Homo erectus. Yeah, Homo erectus. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Homo. <laughs> this is, honestly, what? I do. So I go and talk to crowds of 15-year-old school kids <laughs> and I talk to them about Homo erectus and I always kind of wait and there's a little titter and I go, oh, you're more mature than the last group. You're not. <laughs> <laughs> So the, yeah. there's several... There's about know. 20. Do you want to go through them? Yeah, I do. I'd there's like to know where we came Because I species. thought we all came from the same one. Okay, so, so some room. of the early ones, there's things like Sahil Anthropus Gigensis, which comes from tra- Chad about six or seven million years ago. Nobody really knows what it looked like, apart from it had quite a small head. Um, there's Oren Tugenensis. Um, there's Canyanthropus Platyops, because it's got a f- kind of flat face. Again, these are quite scrappy fossil remains. Don't really know much about these. Then there's these interesting ones called Ardipithecus. Um, so, yeah, Ardipithecus ramidus. Um, still pretty ape-like, although that's always tricky. You kind of tie yourself up in knots because we're apes. But when you say ape-like, you mean more like the other apes than us apes. Um, and then, of course, you get famous ones like Lucy, yeah. who's famous, famous, um, because she was discovered when they were listening to Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, I think. And quite a complete fossil. 40% is pretty complete mm-hmm. in, in um, human paleontology. Uh, and then a little bit later, you get our own genus. You know, their brains are a bit smaller, um, but they, they have a similar kind of body shape to us, so they don't look like anything like chimpanzees anymore. They've got really long legs. They were good runners. And then they kind of expand. We think they expand out of Africa. Well, they might not have done. It depends <laughs> how long you've got. They might have arisen in Asia and then gone back into Africa, we don't really know. Okay. It's, no, you don't know anything, do you? You write a book and then ten years later it's all out of date. My show looks ridiculous uh, now, my it's, Hitler moustache show. It's like with any... <laughs> <laughs> any of this science, though, the more you know, the more you just think you don't actually know definite answers to things. But I'm sure that Homo sapiens, our species, modern humans, evolved in Africa. Because we've got, we've got fossils of Homo sapiens going back much, much earlier in Africa than we have anywhere else around the world. And so about 200,000 years of existence in Africa before we're seen anywhere else. Um, and then genetically, it's Africans are much more diverse than the rest of the world put together. And you tend to see more diversity in the place that a species has been the longest. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we're, we're an African species. And you, do, you went to, the, the, there's that Hobbit species, isn't there, which was just on one island. You went, yeah. you, you went to, you've seen that skeleton, have I you? I laid out the bones. I mean, wow. that, was, that was amazing. That was for that series. And uh, we sat down uh, with the Indonesian uh, scientists and had a long discussion with them. And they said, what do you do? And I said, I'm a biological anthropologist. So I, you know, I do but ske- skeletons, really, is my thing. Um, and then after about an hour's discussion with them, they said, OK, you can lay it out. And I was like, really? <laughs> and so there was this cabinet with lots of little Tupperware boxes, like little sandwich boxes. And that's what The Hobbit was in. Yeah. And I unpacked her and laid her out. And yeah, she was amazing. That sent a shiver down my spine because she was such a weird little thing. Yeah. Very odd. And so is that, is that thought to be like an anomaly or is that that there was a population of, of, of just small people on this island? It was really controversial when it was published. Um, and there were a lot of people saying, as quite often happens with these kind of odd surprises in, in paleoanthropology, people will say, oh, it's, a, it's just an error. Or it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a, maybe a pathological it doesn't look pathological. Uh, and there's lots of them that are all very similar. So I don't think they're pathological. I think they're normal for Homo floresiensis. Um, but we don't, we don't really know what they are. I mean, some people say they're Homo erectus that's got small because they lived on an island. Um, some people say they might be an earlier expansion out of Africa. So something more like Lucy, in fact. Yeah. And, and actually, careful analysis of those skeletons has suggested that they do seem to hark back to something very early. Okay. So there could have been an earlier expansion that we haven't picked up elsewhere. They're not really hobbits, though, right? They're not mm. loads of dead hobbits. No. <laughs> It'd be good if they were. Proved Lord of the Rings, right? And so, <laughs> so is that part of the, the journey to Australia? Because it's sort of incredible the, the, that humans made it to Australia... But was that sort of within the last 50,000 years, or was that...? Is no, the... the dates have been pushed right back, right. actually. So, um, again, you know, 10, 10, 11 years ago, when we made the series, we did cover some quite controversially early dates from a couple of uh, rock shelter sites in, in the Northern Territories. And, and that's now been vindicated. So we, we know now that modern humans got to Australia about 65,000 years ago. Right. 
and there's a nice convergence of archaeological sites and, and genetics that shows that. Right. See, way before they got to Europe. And what about all... Because in Australia, they were, like, all crazy... I mean, marsupials, but also giant kangaroos and just huge yeah. animals. The, when did those animals... Did those animals get at the same time, or are they even more ancient? Are they... Are they, are they did they... Did they drift across with the... Oh, they're the... even more ancient. So, yeah, there are all these Australian megafauna, yeah. big animals. Um, and there's a sort of stunning coincidence between the arrival of uh, humans in Australia and yeah. the disappearance of all the megafauna. That's right, yeah. um, the same as in America. I mean, I don't, I don't think our ancestors went on rampages killing everything, but I think they had a big impact. I mean, yeah. you'd, again, you'd have a go if there was a giant kangaroo around. I'd, yeah. try and kill, I'd definitely try and kill it. Especially if it would never seen a human <laughs> yeah. before. It I'd would probably I'd want just to... let you walk up to it. Yeah. yeah. I'd want to try a bit and see what it tasted like. Yeah. I've, I've eaten some kangaroo. It's all right. I mean, it's not worth wiping out the species for. <laughs> <laughs> but I never got a really big one, so I don't know. Imagine a big kangaroo rib. Like Fred uh. Flintstone, wouldn't it? It'd be good. You'd be hard to resist. Um... <laughs> Has anyone ever confused you with Victoria Corrin? Oh, well, I get this occasionally um, on really Twitter. Like, People say, yeah. oh, you look like Victoria Corrin. I think, oh, really? You look like Victoria Corrin. I've never met Victoria Corrin in the flesh. Maybe so you are Victoria Corrin. So we are the same person. <laughs> but I don't, I don't think so. Oh, there's that other thing, though. People go... I mean, this used to happen to me when I kind of started out doing television. I was doing Time Team, and then I, was doing, I did Coast on BBC Two. And um, I can remember going... Um, this is a very glamorous story going to Shepton Manor Antiques Fair yeah. uh, with my parents-in-law. And there, was, there were two things that happened to me that day um, which really kind of brought me down, uh, you know, to size and, you know, feet on the ground and all that sort of thing. One was I was in the middle of eating a pasty, which is always a bad moment to interrupt <laughs> someone, I think. And this, um, this guy came over and went, can you settle a bet? And I said, I don't know, can I? <laughs> and he said, are you on coast? And I said, yes. And he went, I've lost a tenner. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next one was um, this woman walked up to me I was just looking at a nice table thinking about maybe getting a new table and um, this woman walked up to me and went oh, can I have your autograph? and I said yeah of course you can um, and she went oh, I, don't, I don't have a pen and I was, I, was, I was looking in my bag for a pen and she went and you are Miranda Kristovnikov <laughs> and I said, oh, I'm not actually, but do you want me to forge her name or do you think I write my name? But there is that thing of just, I'm just like a woman on television. And there's this like... Sort of <laughs> you should think that would make you remarkable. People go, it's the woman from telly. Yeah, it's that one. Yeah. What's the name? Yeah, Victoria Corrin, Miranda Kristovnikov. You get there eventually. Um, so what was it like being on, you were behind the scenes on Time Team to begin with because you're an expert on bones, right? So that's, yeah, that's they... I was just writing bone reports to them. Right. They just send me boxes of skeletons and I'd write the reports for them. Um, and then they asked me to go along on a dig in 2001 because um, they knew they were going to excavate a cemetery, basically. So they knew we were going to have lots of bones. <laughs> so that was my kind of debut on Time Team. And they kept on asking me back. And yeah, I kind of thought that was probably going to be it. And then sitting in my office one day and somebody from the BBC rang me and said, we're doing something about coastal Britain and wondered if you'd be interested. Oh, that sounds intriguing. How many bones are in it? Are there going to be bones? Yeah, I did, I did insist on <laughs> bones, actually. So, yeah, I ended up doing it and said, right, you've got to have some bones. Got to do Pavland Cave. And... and what was it like hanging around with the Time Team team? There must have been some crazy times brilliant. with those guys. It was really brilliant. <laughs> it, was, um, uh, it was good fun. The people always go, oh, why does time team have to happen in three days? And it's, it's just because it, it takes a week. Because you go on Monday, you travel to the place, you spend three days digging, and on Friday you go home. During that week, you're staying in a... They used to book big hotels and put everybody up in the same hotel. And it was always, um, obviously, the kind of same core team of presenters and diggers. Um, but all the crew were the same as well. So it was, there was a great sense of camaraderie. Um, a really great sense of camaraderie. And then uh, day three was always very difficult because everyone was just <laughs> dreadfully hungover. I mean, we were just there going, oh, don't come and talk to me. Just let me get on with this little trench and just, oh, I don't, I don't want to find anything. I don't want to. <laughs> but then half the time you had to kind of cook up like mead and stuff and be drinking it in a... Yeah, you know. only if you didn't find anything. <laughs> <laughs> It's quite interesting looking at time teams and you always know that they're really struggling and they're not finding stuff if people start dressing up. 
Because they did. Ch- I think Cheddar Gorge was one of your worst ones. I don't know if you were, did. You go to the Cheddar Gorge? No, I did. I wasn't okay. on that one. The worst one I did was a was a site in Sunderland, um, where I started off on the wrong foot because I I thought, oh, I'm, you know, we had a few we had a few local diggers, and I said, um, I, I didn't really know much about Sunderland, but I told them that my best friend at university was a Newcastle supporter, <laughs> so that was that really. Yeah. And um, and then we spent three days looking for we were looking for a Roman fort, and we found a path. And that was it. <laughs> Three days of digging. It wasn't even in a underground. Park. It was just. <laughs> 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 but that's the beauty of archaeology. I, I did a bit of archaeology when I was uh, on my year, on my gap year, my year off. Uh, did you go to exotic places? No, I went to a field in uh, <laughs> Hampshire, which is quite nice, and a field in Reading, <laughs> which wasn't very nice. That wasn't very good. Fun though, isn't it? Digging stuff up and finding, trying to work oh, out I what it, it is. Yeah, I mean, I, I like the whole process of it, and I've done it for a long time because my my boyfriend at university was an archaeologist. So basically, the only way I could get to spend any time with him in the summer was by going and volunteering on archaeological digs. Um, so I I did have a bit of experience doing digging, but I I just like being outside and <laughs> digging holes. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's not. Nice. It was you know it was, it was very sunny on the on the one I went on. It was nice. It's not always sunny though. No. It was nice. I got off with the Dutch girl. It was good. <laughs> yeah, so wish I could go back. <sighs> <laughs> Talking of which, you did this show where you had to, where you talk, talk, you, you, they created a kind of, uh, sort of Margaret Atwood version of you with the perfect body. Yeah. It was where weird. you had ostrich legs and yeah. sort of elves' ears. We just had a bit of fun with it. Um, it basically came out of conversations I'd had with Roger Highfield, who's the creative director of the Science Museum, over the years. And also just stuff I talk about generally, that you know, the whole fact that evolution doesn't produce perfection. It just kind of produces things, you know, thing, it, it, it's natural selection, working on the material that's already there. And it's kind of, it's, it's good enough. Um, and so, you know, the, the human body is good enough. It's pre- I mean, it's pretty good. I, I'm, I'm an anatomist. I became an anatomist because I was fascinated with how you know, intricate and wonderful it is. But there's lots of bits of it where you go, mm, that's, yeah, I could, do, <laughs> I could do that better. If I was God, not that I believe in God, but if I did believe in God and I was God, uh, I'd redesign it. It's easier um, if you are God. That's, the yeah. that's what gets to me. Well, so that's what I got to do on that programme. Yeah. So I, I basically said, right, there's, there's some stuff you don't even see and you don't know about, but stupid things like this nerve, the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which starts in the neck. It branches off its parent nerve right up here, just under ear. And then it go, kind of gets lost. It goes all the way down to your chest. And then it goes, oh, I forgot, and goes back up the neck <laughs> and goes into the larynx. And you go, oh, that's ridiculous. Just have it coming straight off. So there's all this kind of messy wiring, messy plumbing, um, which could be sorted out if you didn't have to grow as an embryo. That's the, yeah, that's the kind of tricky thing, because embryonic development kind of has you, to go in a certain If you're way. God, you don't have to, you can start getting yeah, rid of that. Yeah, you could just go, boom, yeah. And you don't have to have any of that evolutionary baggage. So when we were making the programme, it was called Perfect Body Always. And then, and then as, as quite often happens, they change the title like a week before it goes out, and they go, oh, it's called can science make your body perfect now? And I was like, that sounds like a cosmetic surgery program. Really weird. Um, but yeah, so the other thing about it was that when we when we talked about it and talked about the idea of it, I hadn't really anticipated that the producers were going to turn around and go, and we're going to do your body. And I was like, <laughs> oh, really? Right. So I got scanned, um, which is, yeah. I mean, that's just awful. And, and that sounds get... like the producer going, oh, yeah, we've got to scan, we've got to scan your body. It's not for us, it's just oh, for the show. No. <laughs> Yeah. I'm, not ta- I'm not even doing anything with the scan, make a 3D model, oh, that. take that God. home. <laughs> <laughs> I could do that, actually, because I've got the data. I could 3D print out tiny really? Alice yeah. Roberts. <laughs> 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 oh, dear. So, yeah, we had, we had a lot of fun with it, and we kind of said, well, human legs, they're, they're generalist legs. They're pretty good at lots of different things. Like, they're good at climbing, they're good at swimming, they're good at running. Let's just focus on one thing. Let's focus on running what do legs look like if you're just doing running? Um, so ostriches are pretty good runners. So I ended up with these kind of weird ostrich legs. But the really odd thing about it was that I was working very closely um, with this artist all the way through. And um, he, I mean, he was absolutely brilliant. And we met up and talked about how the, how the, how the body was going to be adapted um, for the first couple of tweaks, like things like slightly shortening the spine to make it more stable. But then the producer said, oh, will you just let him get on with it now and you're not to see it anymore and you can just have phone conversations with him about it. So I, so I kind of played along. 
So then we had this unveiling at the Science Museum, and I think I actually screamed when, it, <laughs> when they took the veil. I was like, it was just so freaky. Well, also, because you had a... I mean, so I say you, the version of you had a marsupial pouch. So yeah. there's, a, there's a baby's head in your stomach. <laughs> I mean, it's really like... It's sort of like an emergency question... The whole thing is an emergency. If, would you rather have an ostrich's legs or a, a baby's head in your stomach? Good question. It was just... It, that was something I was really keen on, though, because um, I'd done a bit of... Uh, oh, just kind of scoping and asking people on Twitter what they would change. And, of course, loads of people came back, loads of women, but men as well, came back and, can you fix childbirth? And I was like, yeah, I've had two children, let's fix childbirth. Um, so I talked to the producers about that and I said, oh, I want to fix childbirth. And they said, OK, what, what were you thinking? Maybe making the pelvis slightly wider and the baby's head a little bit smaller. And I was like, no, radical. Let's go marsupial. <laughs> and they were like, really? And then I think they had to have all these kind of conversations with the head honchos at the BBC about whether that was going to be OK. And I, was, I absolutely stuck to my guns. I was like, no, this is going to happen. <laughs> um, I want to have, you know, in this kind of fantasy, uh, me, I want to have the ability to give birth to something the size of a, bait, uh, of a jelly bean. Um, and then just put it in a pocket. Yeah. And then when it's ready, you just take it out. It's brilliant. And then you've got someone to put your mobile phone. So. <laughs> it would be useful to have pockets, generally. <laughs> I'd love a tail, though. I'm really, I, I think it's a shame in human evolution that we descended from old world monkeys. And then old world monkeys became apes, these sort of heavier old world monkeys, but without tails. And I would love to have descended from new world monkeys, like spider monkeys, with prehensile tails. Yeah. I think that would be amazing. Some people do have tails, though, don't they? have a little tail. Some people have extra bits of coccyx. Yeah. This is... Oh, the coccyx is quite interesting because people say, oh, well, you know, that's a vestige. It's absolutely not. I mean, it is, it is, I suppose, where our tails have shrunk to, but it's kind of really important because if it shrunk any more, there's nothing for your pelvic floor to attach to. Right. And that's kind of necessary <laughs> to stop everything falling out on the you floor. You want to be in one bit, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I broke my coccyx once. Yeah, I saw you talk about that. What were you doing? Something silly. I was um, dancing on a table yeah. with my friend Julia. Yeah, <laughs> many years ago. Many, many years you ago. You fell on your bum, broke your coccyx. I fell on my bum, broke my coccyx. Yeah. I broke um, my coccyx once. Oh, no, how did so you different. do it? No, I didn't. <laughs> I was trying to make a rude joke about cocks, but it didn't, it's work, didn't, come, out, it's, didn't come out well. Is it, has anybody in the audience broken their coccyx ever? It's yeah. so painful. It's so ridiculously painful. I mean, I didn't really experience the pain that night, I must say, but I woke up the next morning going, <laughs> what the hell happened there? And, um, you know, could hardly sit down for weeks. And it was just awful. But as an anatomist, I get these kind of, you know, strange uh, satisfaction and fulfilment from knowing exactly what has gone wrong. <laughs> so, um, as I said, the, the coccyx is important because the pelvic floor attaches to it. And the pelvic floor is obviously what keeps all the stuff on the inside when you want it to be kept on the inside. And, and then when you urinate or defecate or have a baby, it has to relax to let everything out. Um, and, but it also does this thing of keeping things on the inside at moments when you, you know, really don't want things to come out. So if you cough or sneeze, your pelvic floor reflexively contracts um, to try and keep everything on the inside. Somebody just coughed then in the audience. <laughs> so your pelvic floor just went, <laughs> kept everything on the inside. And just after breaking my coccyx, I had a cold. And so every time I sneezed, I'd be like, at you, ow! Oh. But I knew what was happening, so I got some yeah. satisfaction from that. I thought you were going to say you weed yourself every time you sneezed. <laughs> I thought, this is an inappropriate conversation. I'll have to lose this from the show. Can't have stuff like that on this podcast. No. It's a very... It's a very um, so, yeah, I've been listening to your audiobook. Thank you for reading it yourself. I like that. Not many people read their own audiobooks. I'm far too much of a control freak that anybody else much reading. better. Well, also, you know I know what how to pronounce things. You know how to pronounce things. You know what the author was thinking. And you're, yeah. good. It's a, you're very... You, 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 I was saying backstage, I've, I've been listening to Sapiens by that, that what's-his-face, Harari. You're not, you're not a fan? Mm. I'm not a fan of the bloke reading the audiobook because he says everything in American does numbers like in, in 21 centuries. So it, does, oh. it doesn't say 25th or 20 whatever. You know. I think I just find it a bit disappointing. It's one of those books with a kind of big thesis, but there's not, when you actually look at the foundations of it, it seems a bit shaky. And a lot of the paleoanthropology is about 30 years out of date. I don't like that in a book. Stop changing it all then. Okay. Just keep it the same. <laughs> Make up your mind what happened and stick to it. <laughs> stop, stop being a scientist and finding out you were wrong. <laughs> 
Um, but yours is great, and it's and it's a really interesting um, subject matter. So it's called Tamed. It's about um, the uh, the animals and plants and ourselves yeah. that have yeah. become uh, you know become uh, domesticated by humans, and the effect that sort of has a reciprocal. Uh, so the first the first chapter is about dogs, which you don't you know, and and the way wolves turned into dogs. And I, I got a bit obsessed with the dogs as well. I was like, right, so basically each chapter is going to be ten thousand words, yeah. and then thirty thousand words into dogs. <laughs> I was like, I might have to stop writing about dogs. <laughs> it's really interesting though because I think it's sort of you know you have this idea. I think people have the idea about evolution that it's partly because of that image of the monkey turning into the bigger monkey turning into the man, the caveman. That, image. that it's oh. this it's this process this road that was always going to lead to us yeah uh, which obviously it isn't it's this kind of incredible random thing and that that kind of reciprocation of the dog and the or the wolves and the and the men and women working together and the and and the way that that possibly even helped us evolve into the next stage ourselves or sit in a societal terms anyway um and you know the, a dog is a guard dog that a wolf coming near nearer to the to the camp helps you they help you hunt and, yeah. and then also you're creating this new species we're accidentally obviously from a lot of this domestication is yeah i think a lot of it starts by accident so yeah. we, we like to tell these kind of um quite heroic stories about the past where our ancestors were always you know in charge and coming up with brilliant ideas and i think a lot of the time they're just making mistakes and noticing stuff yeah. um so when it comes to domesticating wheat i think the most likely thing is that people are already harvesting wild grasses and bringing them back and threshing them and they notice that little little wheat plants start to grow up around the th around the threshing floor. So it's kind of about noticing stuff rather than going, oh, do you know what we're going to do today? We're not going to be hunter-gatherers anymore. We're going to go and sow a field of wheat. Yeah. Um, and it's less kind of heroic. But yeah, what you're saying about chance, I mean, I think we really underplay um, chance, serendipity, um, just these kind of... Uh, there's, a, there's a randomness in, in evolution, but also in history as well. Um, you know, there's a that events could have gone off in a completely different direction had it not been for, you know, something falling out a certain way. But I think we do that in our own lives too. I think there's a lot, you know, we'd like to think that we're in charge of our own destinies and there's a lot there's a lot about our lives where you're not in charge of it at all and it's pure chance that you've gone down one route and not another. It's all chance. Have you seen the film Sliding Doors? <laughs> <laughs> Rubbish, isn't it? It's really bad. Uh, but uh, it's really <laughs> stupid. Um... <laughs> But that, you know, it is. If 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 wolves hadn't, if there hadn't been the slightly tamer wolves, if the wolves had all, all run away, and that you know that we would, if we didn't have dogs, would we have turned out at all? Like you know, would human beings have turned out the way they have? Would they, would we have would we have survived? Yeah. All those questions. You sort of you sort of feel that. Uh, that what's an amazing? But I think the amazing thing about the book is such a complicated subject because all these things to try and understand the the consequences they've had. I mean, you can do it in hindsight in a way, but it's it's such a broad. Yeah, amount of, yeah. The, you know, it, even taking 12, you're taking 10, 10 or 12 items, aren't you? The, 10, yeah. 10, yeah. That, yeah. Uh, but uh, it, is, it is about these kind of intertwined histories and then trying to, try, always kind of doing that alternative history thing where you, you go, right, if things had turned out differently, if you took that species away, how different would human history have been? And I think for some of them, it's really profound. So I think with, without horses, human history would have been really different. I mean, horses really underpin warfare for most of most of human history um so yeah i think it would have, would have no been dressage different. either there'd be no dressage no no so you think how different things would have been princess anne wouldn't be as famous as she is <laughs> but the other thing was that. all the interbreeding and that's what really spurred me on to write that book about, about the that royal I, family I to... <laughs> <laughs> i don't know about that <laughs> yeah i i just kept on finding these stories of species interbreeding with other species. I thought, you know, we've, that's been a bit of a revelation and a shock in human evolution. And it turns out that everything else has done it too, even yeah. apples. So, yeah, they're uh, randy apples. They really they? were. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's, it's, fa it's, it's a really fascinating book. And, it go, and it come, we, we sort of domesticated ourselves as a species as well. You know, we've become, we've tamed ourselves without, without knowing that we have as well to become a sort of civilised yeah, and, um, and, and therefore yeah. changed quite tr quite dramatic. It's a, it's sort of interesting when you talk about the domestication of dogs. A that most species of dogs have only been around for a couple of hundred years, so that sort of shows how much, how quickly these things, especially if you if you push them in a certain direction, yeah. how quickly evolution actually does happen. The idea that all, I mean, that, that, the thing that used to get quoted was that all dogs are related to the same pack of wolves from thirty thousand years ago, which might still be true. 
but mm. there might be two or three packs of wolves. Yeah. 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 But the idea that when you know when you see a Great Dane and a Pekingese dog next to each other, and you go, "You're all related to a, the same wolf." They're all they're all ninety nine point five percent genetically European grey wolves. Yeah, it's utterly amazing to think that a Chihuahua is basically ninety nine point five percent grey wolf. It's just yeah, it is yeah. it is bizarre. But when you're picking when you're picking out animals to be more docile, or, or and it's still the truth truth with human beings as well. If you try that. That also has effects on other aspects of their DNA. The DNA is sort of linked together, or just the, the ears change, the snouts yeah, change. Yeah, so, well, it can change. happen at a genetic level. So if you're, if natural selection's acting on um, a particular gene, a particular genetic variant, um, then also the genes either side of it are likely to be quite protected as well. They might be doing something completely different. So that's one way it can happen. And another way it can happen is just that our bodies are really complicated. So. Um, you know, genes might be doing more than one job um, in a developing embryo, for instance. Yeah. Um, and then, and then when you add in, you know, all the other kind of messaging that we've got going on in our bodies with hormones, um, then it all just starts to get really, really complicated. But yeah, interesting things come along for the ride. And you know, with dogs, we've seen that really brilliantly. Well, not with dogs, but with a closely related species, we've seen it brilliantly um, demonstrated with the the breeding of silver foxes in in Russia, which has been this experiment which has gone on for I think about five decades and initially the the silver foxes were just bred to be tame so they would just take the 10 percent tamest foxes in each generation and then breed them on and tameness and friendliness spread very quickly through that population really really quickly so very quickly you had a population of silver foxes that were very comfortable around people licking the keeper's hands not biting them but then they were doing other things as well. They were wagging their tails. They hadn't selected for tail wagging, but that had just come along for the ride. Yeah. Um, and also their coat colour started to vary. And some of them ended up black and white, like collies. It's mad. So there's yeah. all these kind of extra things. So one of the lessons from that is that you have to be really careful when you look at um, the anatomy or the physiology of an animal about saying that every single bit of it is an adaptation. Because a lot of characteristics are probably like that. They're probably just coming along for the ride yeah. rather than being specifically selected for. And it, I think it's, it's the idea as well of that survival of the fittest is quite an unhelpful phrase, for example, which I think oh, people, it's mis terrible. Which people misunderstand because it doesn't mean that the most... Yeah. Like, it's a Victorian fit. phrase and it's, yeah. Yeah, it's not even something that Charles Darwin coined. It means that you fit your environment. Yeah. It doesn't mean that you'll fit in a, in so a kind of... you could be the weakest animal and that could be good in the environment you're in. Like, you know, if you're, it's if hard you're to a, think of a scenario well, where the weakest animal well, would be the best, well, in that, <laughs> the best of it. But, you could be a tiny... Yeah. If you're a tiny animal in a, in a, in a world where there's no food, then you'll survive and the big animals won't. So the fit yeah. animals won't survive. So like in that in that sense. Yeah, it is about fitting your environment. Yeah. And also it's going to change, you know, every generation it's going to, the, the game changes slightly. Yeah. yeah. And what becomes fit to one you know, situation is then not if when human beings turn up in Australia or wherever uh, and, and kill everything, suddenly you weren't the best for your environment no. anymore. No, so. you were great until the because, humans turned up. Yeah. yeah. It was like dinosaurs. Dinosaurs were amazing and had diversified into all these different environments. Um, but you can't, you know, you can, you can be really um, evolutionarily fit, but if a massive rock drops out of the sky, <laughs> it's just, yeah, curtains. We got through there, didn't we? Little rats. Yeah, little scurrying mammals. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, that's another great example of chance and yeah. kind of chance events. If that rock, um, that massive... Uh, asteroid hadn't slammed into the earth into the Yucatan Peninsula uh, 66 million years ago and basically finished off the dinosaurs and a lot of the rest of life on earth you know, three quarters of life on earth was wiped out by that um, mammals would not have got the chance to diversify no. so it's kind of when the dust cleared it was like oh the, <laughs> the dinosaurs have gone brilliant and then you get this very quick radiation of mammals um, you know, with it, yeah, you get you get all sorts of um, you know, sort of, uh, animals living, uh, mammals living in trees, mammals burrowing underground, uh, very very quickly after that. Do you think it's you know the planet Earth could just be like a one-off as a result of that? Because all the chance that would certainly to get to us as human beings or intelligent life that's that survived been in a been in a because a lot of it's environmental as well, isn't it? So like we kind of managed to get through certain periods of time and things have just lucked out for us when the ice ages have ended or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, We've been really lucky the last yeah. few thousand years, actually. The last kind of 10,000 years, the climate's been really stable. Yeah. 
Yeah. So do you think... Do you think that that, you know, it, it's possible it hasn't, even if the universe is massive, 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 it's possible that no other planet has got to this stage? I don't, that's above my pay grade. Is it? I, can't, I can't even have these conversations. Well, I have these conversations with Brian Cox. Um, and um, so uh, he, sometimes when I've talked to him about it, he said, oh, no, there must, be, there must be intelligent life elsewhere. But then we have been listening for a long time. So the fact that we haven't heard anything from space at all, uh, I suppose the other... The other potential fallacy is thinking that there, there must be other inte- that if intelligent life has evolved somewhere else, it must be there now, um, yes. or at least it was there um, whenever it sent its message to us, and it probably isn't there anymore by the time we get to it. Um, maybe maybe civilizations rise up and disappear. Um, well, if there's loads of meteors flying around and smashing yeah. into things, yeah. what chance you got against that? Unless Bruce Willis is around to save you. <laughs> So um, let's quickly talk about uh, the Humanist Association, which are the new president. Humanist of... UK, they are now. Um, they used I'm... to be the British Humanist Association. Well, now I'm still the, I'm, I'm one of their whatever it is. I'm one of the blokes in it. And are I'm you? calling it the Humanist Association. <laughs> one of them. I'm one of the, yeah. what, what's it Humanist called? I don't even know what things. I'm called. Patron, I'm a patron of Excellent. the British. No one told I'm me to change. Hear it. I'm the president. I know, it's better, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, but for how long? I'll still be a patron in three years' time. Where will you be? <laughs> what is it, Pothic? President of the Humanist UK. I like, am yeah. Pothic. Yeah. yeah. That's good. What is humanism? Humanism. I should have asked this before uh, I became a patron. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, humanism is... Uh, it embraces a whole load of things, actually, but there are, there are a few kind of fundamental uh, foundations to it. Foundations are usually fundamental, aren't they? Mm-hmm. Um, it's a natural approach to the world. So we basically accept that the, the universe, the world we live in, it's a natural place. And so we can approach it using, uh, using our rational cognition. We can approach it using science. Um, but there's a really strong um, aspect to it, which is about empathy as well. Because I think some people think that um, atheism is really kind of cold and empty and um, makes you into a very inhumane person. And... And that's what, you know, that's the sort of antithesis of humanism. In humanism, we say, no, the, you know, the world is a natural place. We are evolved biological phenomena. It doesn't make humans any less wonderful. Um, and it doesn't make you any less empathetic and compassionate as a, as a human being, that you don't think there's a god. And in some ways, I think it potentially makes you more moral than ethical. I'm sort of cautious about saying that. But um, I think when I talk to my religious friends, they have this perception that there's a external source of goodness whereas I think the I think the big difference between between being religious and being non-religious in a humanist way is that I think we create the goodness it comes from inside us we have to make it um so yeah it's a it's a very moral and ethical way to live your life but it's based on what you can actually see about the world rather than making stuff up it's sort of weird because what well, but actually, what you know, the made-up stuff isn't as good as the real stuff, is it? I mean, the the idea that we've all evolved through for millions of years and the universe has been here for billions of years, and yet somehow we've scurried yeah. our way through all of this stuff, and that you know, and that you know, your progress as a as a being, all the chance just for you that took all of those uh, ancestors had to survive long enough to create your other other ancestors. Yeah, it's I mean, most, most sensible religious people accept evolution. Yeah. And, you know, the Church of England officially accepts it. The Catholic Church officially accepts it. Um, so it's only very fundamentalist uh, religious people who take their uh, sacred texts literally who believe in creationism. But, you know, it's either a thing. And we have, we have quite a few schools across the UK that teach young earth creationism. So I don't think we can... We can't, you know, we can't be complacent about it. We do need to call it out because yeah. it's, it's anti-scientific. Um, can't prove it. They can't prove the Earth's more than 6,000 years old, can you? We have many ways of proving can't the Earth's more than 6,000 years old. <laughs> can't I mean, prove the, it. Essentially, if you want to believe the Earth is 6,000 yeah. years old, you've also got to believe in a God who's setting out to deceive you because absolutely everything, you know, all the evidence points to an Earth that is 
you know, billions of years old. Not it's just testing you, Alan. It's yeah. testing you. Yeah, is that it's the kind of God you want to you. believe in? That's yeah. an interesting kind of God. Well, no, I want to believe in the kind of God who people. sets all this up in the first place. What the fuck's wrong with him? <laughs> I'm going to create a load of people to judge and make them, like, not perfect. I'm perfect, though. Don't know how I managed that. Uh, to make them not perfect. And then if they don't do what I think they should, I'm going to burn them up in hell. He's not a very nice person, is he? No, well, in, and also the hell <laughs> issue is interesting, I think, in religion at the moment. Because if you go back sort of 100, 150 years ago, people believed in the physical reality of hell. So there was this kind of, um, you know, sort of endless battle between good and evil in the world. And, and God, would, God would protect you and... Um, you know, he was, the good, he was the good side and then obviously there was Satan and, the, uh, uh, and hell on the dark side. Um, so in the 20th century, um, even quite strongly religious people, I'm, I'm talking primarily about Christians here, stopped believing in the reality of hell. So then they've got a really difficult thing to explain. Because if you stop believing in the reality of evil and hell, then how do you explain the fact that there are bad things that happen in the world? Because if there's no, if there's no force making that happen, then does that mean God's making that happen? He's given us the choice. But before he, yeah, but before he created us, there was nothing, there was nothing <laughs> good about it. He's mentally ill. It's the, it's, you know, it's, I'm happy with that. He's mentally ill and he's, a, you know, he's goes, I admire his commitment to creating all this evidence that to convince you that you're right. It's incredible detail he's gone into. Oh. A lot of it hasn't, you know, probably never get found. It's still down there in the ground ready to... Brilliant. He's a great. Guy. But I think that um, I think that kind of mature religions are, you know, they're becoming, they're, they're ditching a lot of the stuff like hell, um, and you know, becoming more, almost more of a kind of um, a code for living your life. And then if that's all that is, then that's just humanism. Yeah. Um, it's just the god bit that's kind of lingering on. But we sort of like again in a new evolution, a social evolutionary sense, we probably needed religion. I mean, that might be religion and art might be what distinguished this between Homo sapiens and the Neanderthals. Might be it might be. I don't think I don't think there was that much difference between us actually. No. Neanderthals did um, made art. They did cave paintings. We know now. They did weird stuff like making little circles of stalagmites in caves. If you don't know what's going on yeah, there, don't know what that's about. Uh, and uh, just moving stones around—that's insane. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, that, but that social cohesion that religion gives—it's it's another cultural identity which makes your group strong. I think I sort of think you needed it to get through to this point. But if we stick with religion, if if we don't leave religions behind now, then we're probably going to be fucked. We I sort think of one, yeah, one of the one of the problems I have with it, and one of my worries about it, is that it's it's divisive. Yeah. And I think we kind of need to embrace everybody. Um, so, you know, the Humanist UK do all sorts of um, great things like training humanist celebrants. You know, we've got most people in this country are not religious now, but we still need ways of marking those important landmarks in our lives. And so that's one of their important functions. Another important function is supporting people who've left, you know, highly controlling religions in the UK and abroad, uh, where you sometimes have people being threatened you know, with death because they've left a particular religion. Um, and I forgot what I was going to say next. <laughs> this never happens. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, yeah, I have this effect on women. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> but, you know, I, th I think that's, that, that's... I forgot what I was going to say what as well. That was, what I was going to say something great. Just before I started I talking about I don't know. I don't that. know what's going on. But, uh, <laughs> what's happening. but, no, I think... Was because if people believe that... You know, I think if people still believe that God is ultimately looking over us and is going to sort everything out, that's not going to do the planet any good, is it? So we need to, we need to take control of ourselves, of, of the planet, I think, and accept. You thought what it is? And the other really important yeah, thing okay, they yeah. do... <laughs> so important, I forgot it. <laughs> and the other really important thing they're doing is, is you know, challenging things like um, having faith schools which can select, uh, on the basis of religion, children coming into those schools. That's just socially divisive. We need to have schools that are for everybody. We need our ch if we want a cohesive society, we need to have children mixing together. Mm -hmm. We don't want to segregate and separate children out into separate schools. I think that's a really bad idea. Do you think the world's kind of gonna? Do you think the world can work if if the, this sort of rejection of experts and common sense and logic and truth carries on? I mean, that sort of seems to be this little trend we're having now, where people can say, oh, "I don't care about experts or facts." Yeah, think, people tend that to say just... that until it matters to them. Yeah. And then I think when it really matters, they, they do go to the experts. Yeah. yeah. Like the doctors and things. They yeah, don't it's tend kind to of, go, yeah, yeah. They're lying to us. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
But do you think it's? Do you think that's? It's sort of a weird position we're in right at the moment, where that's in, you know America, UK, we seem to be beholden to these uh, people just talking nonsense and. and there is, uh, yeah, not it's very about difficult to gauge it, isn't it? So I mean, this is something that um, Richard Dawkins has attempted to do at various times to kind of gauge how much nonsense is believed by by, by various people. Um, I don't know if it is getting worse um, or we're just more worried about it. But I do think, I do, I, I mean, I think that events and, and political events and social events of the last few years um, in different places across the world, I think, I think they do force us to look at ourselves and look at where we're going with our society. I, it cannot be right that um, there is a perception that there's a small group, a small elite group of people who essentially have the power because they have the knowledge and then people are worried about that so they don't want to they don't want to pay lip service to the experts because that represents this elite group of people we've got to knowledge is power and we need to share it more widely so i think the solution is not to is not to kind of throw your hands up in horror um, about things like um, you know trust in science i think there's still a very healthy degree of trust in science and you can't just trust a thing without it being trustworthy anyway um, but I do think we need to make sure that, um, I mean, science in particular, I'm really interested in the fact it should, be a, it should be a social project that we're all involved in. And we should be doing it more as a whole society. I don't know how we do that. We're trying to think in universities about how we do that better. You know, if we, yeah. how we can go out, rather than just talking to the public about the research that we're doing after we've done it, going out to the public much earlier and saying, what, what research do you want us to do? I mean, scientists are public servants. And I think they'll, that's choose, part of the... they'll choose stupid stuff, Alice. The people there the is people always the worry. There is always the boating with boat face worry. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but, well, in the, in the book, you talk about um, the fact that the first farmers basically affected the climate when there was, like yeah. a, when there was maybe a, a million human beings and just the methane or whatever created yeah. might have got us through the ice age and changed the temperature of the earth. You can just then. start to see these little changes, yeah. So you can start to see human impact on the climate, which we think of being a very recent thing and just having happened since the Industrial Revolution. And there's no doubt that it's been, you know, very fast yeah. since then and, and growing and increasingly fast. Um, but there is a little impact that you can see, as you say. When, yeah. you start, when our ancestors started cutting forests down, that was the main thing. Yeah. So when you start clearing forests, you do actually see the normal, it's a, a, a kind of, the normal patterns of climate variation are just are just perturbed. Hmm. Yeah. So do you think so, will science save us from ourselves, and and will it save the climate, and will stop stop the climate kind of getting the world in and no, uninhabitable? No, science is just a tool. Um, will save us from ourselves. So again, it needs to be you know a whole a whole society, yeah. um, a whole global society coming together to do that. Um, I think we can use science, but we need to use it very carefully. There's a couple more billion people going to turn up. Yeah. And the, but then it's going to level out. Is yeah, it will theory? level out. Because, and, and also, if we want it to level out quicker, the best thing you can do is um, help developing countries to develop. Because we know that as soon as a developing country develops, the reproductive rate comes down. So I get that occasionally on Twitter, there are people going, oh, there's too many of us. What are we going to do about it? And I'm, thinking, I'm always slightly worried when people start going, what are we going to do about it? I'm like, <laughs> oh, OK. Um, if you want to do something about it, then give money to developing countries. Stop having give money sex. to projects. You could do that. Uh, these guys are really, really behind that one. We though. have discovered, though, <laughs> that over the course of the 20th century, we've discovered ways of having sex and not necessarily having children. Really? I don't know if that's a good I don't know, I've had no. sex twice. <laughs> <laughs> it's been ama it was amazing. <laughs> like both times were good. Um, oh, I mean, I could talk to you all day, but I'm not allowed to. So uh, I'm going to have to stop talking to you. Let me see if there's anything else I need to talk. I haven't asked you any emergency questions, so that's good. Um, <laughs> Are the emergency questions just that they're just, they literally just, they're well, the in these case you run out. Of people like them, you know, people like them. <laughs> but I'm not here to entertain these people. I'm here, to, <laughs> I'm here to find out about having sex with monkeys. That's what I'm here about <laughs> for. And I've got that. Um, so I'm mainly happy. Um, uh, you like swimming in the wild. I do. Yeah. <laughs> What's so good about that? Isn't it a bit cold? Uh, yeah, you can wear a wetsuit. Oh. Um, no, I just read really, it. Yeah, I I, 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 I like a swimming pool. I quite like swimming in swimming pools, but I much prefer to swim 
just in yeah lakes, rivers, the sea, much nicer. Yeah, and it's a nice way of being. I, I did a I did a program on wild swimming ten years ago, uh, and did this beautiful swim down the Y, and it is just lovely. I mean, you are immersed in nature, and you see nature in a different way. And I remember on that swim, it, you know, it had a couple of kingfishers swim right across in front of me. It's just amazing. What yeah, about the condoms in the river? Yeah, you can check with environment agency the cleanliness <laughs> of the, <laughs> the waterway that you're planning to. When I was about yourself in. 15, I had to help clear out the river up the gorge. I thought there's a little river runs yeah. through. And I picked up a Johnny and I didn't know what it was, and everyone laughed at me because I was holding it. No. Just oh. reminded me of that. So that's why I don't go wild swimming. Is that in Cheddar? <laughs> now, it was in Cheddar Gorge. <laughs> I was just there yesterday. That's what reminded me. I was, part, I was wheeling my son around because he wouldn't go to sleep in a pram. I'm not strange. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and then I was past that bit. I thought, oh, that's where I got that condom out the river. Oh, no. And I went, what? And, then, <laughs> and I didn't know what it was, and everyone was laughing. They've got lots so of cheese it. shops in Cheddar. Yeah, it's weird, I that. Like I don't Cheddar. know what that's about. Oh. It's nice. I like, you, I like you... walking up on the top above Cheddar. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, up walking up to the gorge and walking over the top. And there's a really nice place called Drayton Slights. Um, Do you know Drayton Slights? No? No, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> recommend it. <laughs> it's beautiful up there. Do visit Cheddar. It's quite it's mystical, wonderful. isn't it? Yeah. It's kind of... I, I, was, I was on tour talking about British archaeology earlier this year, and I'm going to do it again in the autumn. But I was, um, I was asking about this, this particular find from Starcar in Yorkshire, which is something which looks like it might be a red deer headdress. And it's this kind of bit of bone from the skull of a red deer and the antlers sticking off it. Um, and the suggestion is that these are headdresses. They've got holes drilled into them. Um, my husband, who has been a field archaeologist for many years and always goes to the most mundane explanation for anything and hates the any kind of ritual explanation of things, I said to him, look, I can't think of what else these can be. They must be headdresses. I can't see any other reason for doing that. And he said, could be a coat hook. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't told the discoverers of the headdresses that theory yet. But I've been going around the country saying to people, right, just you know, checking with audiences. Can we do it with these guys? See how many of them think... The red deer yeah. things might be... Can we have the lights up a little bit? So the red deer skulls that have been kind of carved out with holes in them. And my husband said, well, they could have just been tied onto a post in your house as a coat hook. So can I have a show of hands of who you think they're much more likely to be kind of mystical headdresses used in ancient dances, ancient kind of pagan rituals? Who thinks it's a headdress? OK, thank you. Now put your hands down. You're not allowed to put your hand up again. Um, he thinks it's more likely to be something mundane like a coat hook. Not necessarily a coat hook, but something more Definitely mundane. Definitely a coat hook. Yeah, that's most people, isn't yeah. it? Thank you very much. This is, so I'm collecting this data, and I've got a theory <laughs> that the closer you get to Glastonbury, the more mystical people become. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's not just a north-south thing. Because yeah. originally I thought, oh, it's weird. You know, the further north I go, people are, get, people are much more rational. And yeah. the further south I go, people are starting to get a bit more mystical. They like the headdresses. <laughs> and, then it's an, and then it's also an east-west thing as well. So it does seem to be converging on Glastonbury. It's because there's a lot of crystals in Glastonbury, so they are affecting, there are. Yeah, they're affecting a, people's uh, minds and with witches. their magical powers. There are witches yeah. in Glastonbury as well. You know, my history teacher's related to the Skellington from off of Cheddar Caves. There's a Cheddar man. He's they, not... Yeah. They did his mitochondrial DNA. <laughs> <laughs> they did the mitochondrial DNA. It's different. It's a new thing. Cylindrical mitochondrial uh, DNA. And he's related to the mum of that skeleton. My history yeah, I teacher, think that was um, based on yeah, just his like uh, mitochondrial haplogroup. So it meant that ten percent of the ten percent of the British population would also have been related to that wow. person. It's not quite as impressive. It's like when people go, "I've got Viking ancestry," and you go, <laughs> "Everyone's got Viking ancestry." <laughs> I'm related We're to... all mixed up. We're all really mixed up. Yeah. <laughs> bad, bad. I found out about that when I was in, I was in Australia and me and, we and Stu were doing the double, the double acts in 1997 and we, did, we were doing a routine about Mr. Target from my school. We just mentioned him in a routine and the tech said, you know, you're Mr. Target, you mentioned that routine. He's related to a 10,000-year-old skeleton and the root news had just reached Australia about this guy. And he recognised it from the routine he was doing from the lights for. I thought you were going to say he was a cousin. He was. He's probably oh, related. Lost brother. Australians yeah. can't be related to those skeletons because they're too far away. We've... Thanks for coming on my podcast. I'm sorry I'm silly. And uh, it's very, it's very, um, <laughs> it's, it's very interesting to hear all that stuff. 
and come back in 10 years and tell us how everything's all different than what you just told it was. Oh, it was yeah. Thanks so much for coming in. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Alice Roberts here on tour. Thanks here on tour. Fantastic. Read her books. Awesome. Thank you very much. We'll be back next week with some more. How do you like them sky potatoes? <laughs>